Hi everyone, it's Seth. So today I'm going to do the commentary I promised on the essay by Moshe Feldenkrais on the primacy of hearing. If you aren't familiar with the essay, I actually read it aloud in a previous video. So I'll put the link to that below this one. And I'm not going to go point by point through everything. In fact, I'd like to start at the end of the essay because what he builds up to is he proposes an experiment for you to do, which is to blindfold yourself. And as I pointed out, if you just close your eyes and commit to keeping them closed, that's fine. But you blindfold yourself and you spend a half an hour in your home just living your life. And so, again, just sitting in a chair doesn't count. Um, I suggested that to do this, and I'm in this video, I'm also, again, going to urge you to actually try this experiment. I suggested go to the bathroom, go to the kitchen, get a drink of water, do things. Of course, you're going to be inept in, unless you are not sighted uh, in the first place, and this is what you're used to doing. But if you're primarily used to relying on your eyes and your vision, you'll discover the, 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 this isn't simple. You need to go slow. You're probably going to be feeling around with your hands to see where you are. But you're going to, to have a very interesting experience in terms of how you're relating to yourself and how you're relating to the world. And this slowing down, it's of course practical, so you don't bump into things or hurt yourself. But You'll also notice that beyond just that simple safety precaution, you have to start listening in a deeper way. And on the primacy of hearing, obviously, when we think about hearing, we think of the ears. When I say listening, you're probably thinking of your ears. But actually, I mean listening in a broader sense of paying attention, listening to yourself, listening to your surroundings, listening to the relationship, right? So this is what the experiment is about. And in the essay, so I'll, I'll go through some of the points in the essay now, but just, just to highlight, he, he presents the experiment at the end and he says that the experiment is going to, it's, it's going to give you a concrete experience of the points he's talking about in the essay. And above all, he's, he's trying to show you that the fact that for most people, we rely on our eyes over our ears is a real loss. It's a real loss of capacity uh, in terms of function, in terms of learning. And so you can have a real transformation through doing this particular process. And he recommends, you know, you can do this more often. Now, it's a very simple experiment, but it's just worth pointing out that it's along the same lines of Moshe Feldenkrais's main teaching tool, um, which is awareness through movement. In an awareness through movement lesson, typically you're lying on the floor, although you could be standing, you could be walking, you could be in other positions. But there's a series of movements that you're asked to explore. And you're always being asked to deeply listen to how you make the movements, the sensations, the feelings. And so, and, and often what you're doing is things that we would consider non-habitual. So you're exploring movements that might correspond to movements you do in daily life, but because it's so slow, because you're on the floor or because of some other parameters that he creates for you, it kind of takes you out of the normal context. So it's like you have a new frame to have a fresh experience, even if it's just about, for example, flexing and extending your ankle. Anyways, let's talk a little bit more though about the essay and why he is so interested in inviting us to function with primarily our ears 
instead of our eyes, at least as an experiment. He's not saying stop using your eyes or anything like that. But so quickly, he points out in the beginning of the essay that when you were in your mother's womb, you were already hearing. You were having experiences of vibration, not the same as an adult human and what they hear, but hearing that hearing sense is getting woken up at a point in time where you're still seeing nothing. You're in the dark. And of course, when you're born, it takes some time for your eyes to adjust and for you to begin to make sense of the world visually. But your hearing has already been primed a bit before being born. And so we could say that it's it's older. The, the sense of hearing is older than the sense of seeing. And when you're you're just a little infant, Feldenkrais says you are a hearing animal. And your primary tasks when you're very young are learning how to speak and how to walk. And so with walking, you can imagine that, that vision gets involved, but with, with speaking, that's very much about relating to sound, right? And um, so he makes a, a really interesting point. If you're someone who's learned a second language in life, you probably learned that second language, you know, if it was in school, which is how most people learn a second language, you probably learned it by, by using your eyes, you, you know, reading books or looking at a teacher. Whereas your first language, you were just picking up sound. And he says, you know, when you're relating with your eyes, that's two thirds of the world, you know, everything beyond your peripheral vision that, that you're not using. Whereas in hearing, you're using all of it. So again, just to think of the experience of learning a language primarily with the ears versus primarily with the eyes. Let's just say you learn both languages, but first of all, generally your accent is much better when you learn that first language, right? And then we have those ways of speaking a second language, but everyone can pick up that we're a foreigner, right? But if you just think of your, your seeing and you, you kind of give yourself blinders, and so you can't have any peripheral vision, what if you lived like this all the time? How does that feel? How does it feel emotionally? How free to move do you feel? So if you can extend the metaphor, it's like your first experience of learning has this expansive 360 degree you know, feeling to it. And then you learn your second language in this restricted space. So I think it's a really interesting example he uses about the learning because it's 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 not so much what's my experience of can i make it you know down the street without my eyes uh or maybe primarily i use my eyes i don't pay attention to hearing but whatever the case the sort of daily functions but he's also pointing out like you're in a very different relationship to the world overall and so you're thinking you're learning everything is quite different once you restrict the space down to the space of seeing only. Okay, so the next section of the essay, he's going to talk about three different versions of reality in terms of how we perceive it. And this too is going to tie into this question of what has happened to us when we've restricted our awareness to the space of seeing uh, and we don't primarily use our hearing anymore. So when we're young, he says, everything is subjective. I have this experience. And even though I'm relating to my mother, my father, uh, a sibling, my assumption is everyone's having the same experience as me. What, what I'm experiencing, that's reality. So eventually, we're going to figure out that my version of reality is different than your version of reality. But there's this concept of objective reality. So if you and I both see a color and we both call it red, we might say objectively that's red. Now, we also know that you and I can't actually completely verify that my version of red and your version of red is the same. So that's kind of an interesting problem. And Feldenkrais talks about a third version of reality, which he just calls reality, but he uses a capital R. So reality with a capital R, 
And that would be the reality that, you know, it's out there beyond us. Um, you and I see a particular thing and we agree that it's there, but maybe a third person doesn't see it. So is it there or not? Um, what is the actual way the world really is, you know, <laughs> which, which is probably there's all kinds of features of the world which we can't perceive. You know, just think of dogs are able to hear frequencies that we can't hear. They're able to smell things we can't smell. So those things that they smell or hear that we're not perceiving, they're part of the world, right? So humans have a range of what we can perceive. But some of us are perceiving more than others. And so here's where he begins to talk about awareness, right? So awareness is how we develop a relationship with more of what he's calling capital R reality. And so just to remind you again, if we're dealing with hearing, this is the reality that we're dealing with. We're dealing with reality in 360 degrees. But if it's just vision, it's cut down. And of course, if you primarily use your eyes, it doesn't mean that you don't use your ears. But what he's saying is you haven't really developed your ears. You haven't, or, or you've, 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 left, <laughs> you've left behind the development of your ears. Now, he does talk at one point about people who are particularly sensitive to hearing. He doesn't talk about musicians in particular, but you could imagine a musician. And he, he just talks about how different those people's experience is. But when he's, he's sort of building up to talking about this experiment where he's going to ask you to go around blindfold, he says, you know, what, what is it that makes us humans so different than the other animals? Well, other animals are born in such a way that their nervous system is pretty much completely formed. And, you know, there are animals that they're immediately walking, they're, they're doing most of their adult functions in a very short amount of time. Whereas the human baby is basically helpless in the beginning. It takes a long, long time to learn all the functions to become a functioning adult human. And he also points out, you know, you're born in China, you're going to learn Chinese. You're born in France, you're going to learn French. You're born uh, in the United States, you're going to learn English. And we do this without a problem. So we adapt to our environment, that which we find ourselves in. And you think of, you know, the different people in your life, and the different kinds of skills they have. Well, they were all growing up in different kinds of environments, assimilating what was there. And so learning is crucial to what makes us human. And we can develop all kinds of capacities uh, through learning and, and, and things that we do without thinking such as walking, or he gives the example, the ability to see a three-dimensional shape portrayed on a two-dimensional piece of paper. These kinds of things we can't do at first and we have to learn them. So Feldenkrais worked with many people who had neurological deficits. And he points out, he says, you know, a lot of my clients, the, the issue they have is they've lost something that's actually learned. So he makes a distinction between our sort of animal structure, like the stuff, you know, right from the beginning, we could do things like we could breathe, we could swallow, we could digest. We didn't have to learn that. That was, that was there right from the beginning. But, you know, being upright, talking, um, many of these things are learned capacities. And so what he does in Awareness Through Movement is he... He kind of has this brilliant way through movement, through the body, to reawaken uh, different capacities that we may have lost or, or, or never developed in the first place. And this experiment of going around blindfold, it's, it's putting you in a place where you have no choice but to use your ears in a way that maybe you haven't done for decades since you were you were a little infant since you were that hearing animal and whether or not you 
think that you're going to be in this situation. He points out, look, if you're an animal in the jungle and you don't have 360 degree awareness, you're toast, right? But he says, look, a samurai can do that. The martial artist, Christ was a black belt in judo. We can develop this capacity. So he's inviting you to do that. And he says that, uh, he says in some disciplines, they would say that the tonus of your entire being is heightened to buoyancy and freshness through doing uh, this kind of a practice. He says your memory can be restored to being like childhood. I don't think that happens if you do the experiment once, but he's just telling you this is this is what can really be woken up. So again, I'm going to urge you to try out the experiment. Um, just one further note here. Moshe Feldenkrais created thousands of awareness through movement lessons, and he was very interested in the eyes, which, you know, is for most of us our primary sense for orienting in the world. And so he created all kinds of um, explorations of how we use our eyes. Interestingly, despite this essay, he really doesn't have a whole lot uh, of material about hearing in terms of awareness through movement lessons. Now, when I was in my Feldenkrais training, there was a practitioner there who was uh, helping out with the sound, you know, for the, the trainer was speaking and we were recording the sessions and whatnot. And he was the sound guy. And um, his name is Joel Zimba and he, he is blind. And he's, he's also a Feldenkrais practitioner. So one day I just kind of asked him, I was like, well, there's all these ATMs for the eyes. Like, do you, do you really get anything out of that? And he said, no, not really. And then I asked him about the, the ears. What, what, what about, are there any ATMs for the ears, uh, ATMs, awareness through movement? And he said, no, but then he sort of suggested, because there's uh, one of the things that Feldenkrais plays with, with, with the eyes is covering the eyes, right? To block out the light and then to let the light back in. This is, again, thinking of the infant. The infant experiences the stimulation of light long before they can actually sort of take in the world in detail and do something we would call seeing. So anyway, uh, Feldenkrais has, has processes where you cover and uncover the eyes and that kind of thing. So Joel said to me, well, I suppose you could begin experimenting by covering and uncovering the ears. And so I got really interested in that. And um, I'm going to also be uploading an awareness through movement lesson that I created, which it's, it's more like a formal awareness through movement lesson. There's a series of steps to it. But it's, it's similar to this experiment that Feldenkrais proposes in so much as I invite you into relating to the world through your ears in a way that you probably typically don't do. And so that's something that um, I'll also upload on this channel and I'll link it to this video and I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, I'll just say that I have been inspired also by um, an author and a Feldenkrais practitioner named David Cates, who wrote this book, Listening with Your Whole Body. And so he's a practitioner who has really worked quite a lot with sound and hearing. And there is also a practitioner by the name of Francois Combeau, um, I believe he's French <laughs> by the sound of it, um, who has created a number of awareness through movement lessons uh, that incorporate different ways of playing with hearing. Um, and so uh, I just want to acknowledge both of those practitioners, uh, if you're curious beyond what I'm offering here to explore uh, hearing and the Feldenkrais method. Okay, so um, in any case, uh, that was my discussion of uh, the primacy of hearing by Moshe Feldenkrais. Thanks for watching. See you next time.